My dear friends, we gather in prayer as always in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Today we gather to celebrate the fourth Sunday of Lent and to prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. We call to mind our sins and we ask for mercy and pardon. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May God Almighty have mercy upon us, forgive us our sin, and bring us all to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for a greater faith and love. Gracious God, your word, Jesus Christ, spoke peace to a sinful world and brought humankind the gift of reconciliation by the suffering and death he endured. Teach us, the people who bear his name, to follow the example he gave us. May our faith, hope, and charity turn hatred to love, conflict to peace, death to eternal life. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who is alive and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, where I have chosen my king from among my sons. As Jesse and his sons came to the sacrifice, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. Not as man sees, does God see. Because man sees the appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. In the same way, Jesse presented seven sons before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Jesse replied, There is still the youngest who is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send for him. We will not begin the sacrificial banquet until he arrives here. Jesse sent and had the young man brought to them. He was ruddy, a youth handsome to behold, and making a splendid appearance. The Lord said, there, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel, with the horn of oil in hand, anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In verdant pastures, he gives me repose. Beside restful waters, he leads me. He refreshes my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. With your rod and your staff, they give me courage. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my light, there is nothing I shall want. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The Lord, the Lord is, is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness, rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, 
and Christ will give you light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus passed by and saw a man blind from birth. He spat on the ground and made clay with saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said it is, but others said, no, he just looks like him. He said, I am. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So when the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see, he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful person do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said to the man born blind, what do, you, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin, and are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the church say amen. Amen, amen. amen again. Amen. So, when is the last time you gave sight to the blind? Have you ever given sight to the blind? Especially somebody born totally blind. When's the last time you did it? I think this is the measuring stick, I would say, for Christianity and uh, for our journey, especially during this Lenten season. Um, whenever sometimes we think about giving sight to the blind, we're always thinking about uh, the miracles of Jesus, the extraordinary works that Jesus did, um, giving sight to somebody who was born blind. And we imagine in our eyes or in our minds, we imagine this person walking around unable to see, and Jesus comes to that person and makes clay and does the, the ritual, and that person begins to see. And that could be the miracle. But we have also have to remember that we are reading the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, a little side note, the Gospel of John doesn't have miracles. It has signs. And this is one of the signs that Jesus performed. And I'll come back to that. Giving sight to the blind is not only the work of the greats such as Jesus. Giving sight to the blind is a work of every Christian. I dare say that most of us 
knowingly and unknowingly, have given sight to the blind. If you have ever sat in a classroom with children and been a teacher, well, you have been opening eyes all along. Because as those kids come into class, they walk into class as if they were blind. And by the end of the school year, their eyes are opened just a little bit. Remember, in today's gospel passage, the opening of the eyes happens. It is a process. Jesus puts the clay, go wash. So over time, all the teachers, I would say, they give sight to the blind. If you have ever raised a child, parents, when these children are born, they don't see everything. It is through interaction with them, in raising them, in correcting them, that you and I as well give sight to the blind. Of the many people who have given sight to the blind, I hold at least a couple of these in the forefront before I come to Jesus, because Jesus is the greatest, right? And you'll be surprised at this, right? Um, The one whom I hold high in giving sight to the blind is a man by the name whom we used to call Madiva, Nelson Mandela. How did Nelson Mandela give sight to the blind? And how long did it take for Mandela to give sight to the blind? Was Mandela a miracle worker? Many would say, maybe not. I say, absolutely. Mandela was sentenced to jail for 27 years in apartheid South Africa. Because the people who sent him to jail were blind. Somehow, they could not see that black South Africa was the same as white South Africa. And that was a blindness in their experience. They regarded the Africans, what what we call call back home, the natives, as less than human. It took the pain of jail, the pain of the apartheid struggle in South Africa to open the eyes of white South Africa that these others are also human beings and to open the others to the evils of the apartheid. Mandela opened the eyes of everybody in South Africa that, you know, being black is skin deep. And that was his struggle. His struggle was not to say, his struggle was was to just to open the eyes of the others and say, hey, we are human too. We have feelings too. We have, we cry, we we feel pain just like you. The, The fact that we look a little different from the outside doesn't make us less human. Mandela, sight giver. In the United States experience, uh, in the civil rights, the fight for the civil rights, we put uh, Rosa Parks, right, as somebody who opened eyes, and that opening of the eyes of Rosa Parks was very painful for her. But all she was doing was saying, I'm tired. I'm a human being. I'm tired. And in that struggle, she too opened the eyes of of America. Our journey as a people, as believers, is to open our eyes that we may see like God sees. Like God sees. I like very much what happens in today's uh, readings. Actually, before I get to today's readings, um, uh, there's another episode in the scriptures that I find fascinating that talks about the opening of the eyes because each one of us has blind spots and uh, and sometimes we don't see things that are hidden I love this English expression that are hidden in plain sight and today's readings invite us to reflect on those things and experiences where God sometimes hides in plain sight. And I've told this story many, many a time. There is a story in the second book of Kings, chapter 6, about uh, the, uh, the, the Amerians were fighting the Israelites. 
And um, the Amerians would gather in council and plot against the Israel, against Israel. Whatever the Amerians would plant or plot against the Israel, the Israel always seemed to be a step ahead of the Armenians because there was a man of God in Israel by the name of Elisha who was so filled with the Spirit and he was able to tell the king of Israel whatever it is that the Armenians were planning. So the king of Armenia called his council and said, somebody is leaking information here. Who is the leaker? Where is the leaking coming from? They said, no, there isn't a leaker here. There is somebody in a town called Dothan. His name is Elisha. He's the one telling the king of Israel our plans. So the Aramanian king sends his battalion to Dothan, surrounds the city of Dothan, and they're advancing towards Elisha's house. Elisha's servant wakes up early in the morning, and he goes outside, he sees uh, the Aramanians coming towards, or coming towards Elisha's house. It's surrounded. He goes in the, in the house and wakes Elisha up, and he says, My gosh, we are going to die, we are going to die. They are, we are surrounded. Elisha comes out. He isn't freaked out at all. He's calm as a cucumber. <laughs> he comes out, he looks around, he sees the Aramanians, and his servant shakes Elisha. Maybe he's not woken up yet. Can't you see we're going to die? And then Elisha said, don't you worry, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The servant looks around, he only sees himself and Elisha. He says, what do you mean? And then Elisha prays and says, O oh Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the scriptures say, and the eyes of the servant were open, and he saw battalion upon battalion of angels surrounding that city. The heavenly host surrounding the city, the, the, the angels that he did not see, and the story, you should read it by yourself, the story continues where uh, the Aramanians are led into the hands of the, um, uh, the Israelite king who sets a feast before them. It's a fascinating story. What I love about this story is the prayer of Elisha. O Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Now, there are those who believe that probably there were angels with wings that had surrounded uh, the city of Dothan. And then there are people like myself uh, who were raised by the Jesuits to be a little bit skeptical uh, and plant our feet on the ground who say, there could have been heavenly hosts that surrounded the city of Dothan that outnumbered the Aramanians. Or there could have been more people in Dothan who loved Elisha and showed him a way out. And they said, come this way. We'll hide you here. We'll do this for you. Because the angels of God don't necessarily need to have wings. And I have experienced this during my moments of great suffering. <laughs> When God sent angels, if I was to write this in scripture, that in my darkest moment, when I saw myself surrounded by what would absolutely defeat anyone, angels came. But my eyes could not see those angels. And those angels were in the people that come to Rabuni, in the people that I met sometimes on the street, in the email that came sometimes in the middle of the night and said, we support you. We love you. Those are the angels of God that, I, that my eyes have been opened to. I have found that uh, God surrounds us in all these experiences because my eyes sometimes we are blind to seeing God in these different areas. So in this Lenten journey, we, find, we ask ourselves, how is God opening our eyes? To the scriptures today, David is chosen. But at first, he doesn't have the appearance. And what I love about the first reading is these wonderful, beautiful words. For God does not see the way that human beings see. The journey of the, uh, the catechumen and the journey of all of us during this Lenten season is that you and I see the way that God sees. Because 
we think about the gospel, the, bar, the man born blind, sometimes we are blind because of our experience, because of where we are raised, because of how we are raised. But the journey is for you and I to see as God sees. For God doesn't look at appearance, God looks at the heart, the experience of somebody. May the members of Rabuni and all those who watch us be the kind of people who have the courage to see the heart, to see the heart of a person. In fact, to be one with their suffering, to be one with their journey. Never, never, ever to be quick at judging, but always to be patient to understand the story of the other. Um, the gospel passage, quite briefly, um, Jesus heals this man born blind. I want you to go back to last week, um, especially for the catechumens and for all of us during this Lenten season. Go back to last week, the story of the woman at the well, and look at her progression. She met a stranger. She spoke with a stranger. And then she went into town, and she says, I've met somebody who told me everything about myself, and they came back, and then she was Lord. So here was the journey of the, the Samaritan woman. Jesus, stranger. Jesus saw. Jesus becomes a prophet. Jesus becomes the Messiah. She met a stranger. She saw. He, I think he's a prophet. He's the Messiah, the one we have been waiting for. That was the progression. Look in today's gospel passage. Jesus is unknown to this man. He's a stranger. Jesus becomes sar as well. I met this man. Jesus becomes a prophet for this man as well. And in the end, Jesus becomes Lord. The same journey. A journey that you and I are invited to participate in, in how we know the Lord. Where are you in your knowledge and in your experience of the Lord Jesus? Is he some great teacher? Is he some strange teacher? But wherever you are, we are on a journey where Jesus is stranger, sir, Lord, Messiah. These are the experience. This is the journey of the catechumen. This is the journey of the believer. What I find interesting in today's gospel passage is how those who were the religious leaders could not walk that journey. They were stuck. It was as if the institution that they belonged in stopped them from seeing that progression. This man from Galilee, this great teacher, this Lord, is our Messiah. And before we judge the religious leaders, we ask ourselves, what sometimes stops me in my journey to recognize the Messiah or actually to see the Messiah in the people around me? To see the Messiah in the experiences around us? One thing for sure as we go through this painful process where we are now with this coronavirus, perhaps our eyes are going to be open in a new way, the other world. Perhaps now we will realize more than ever how much, when the African says in the Ubuntu, I am because you are, how much connected we are. What makes us human? For, the, for us Southern Africans, we say, not I am because I think. <laughs> That's the, for us Africans, we say, I am because you are. Ubuntu. A person becomes a person through the experiences of, uh, of other people. Perhaps this is a new way we're going to start seeing each other. First of all, it was out there in China. Then it was out there in Italy. <laughs> then it's here. We are all connected, all human, all one. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one heals, the healing spreads to everybody else. Amen. That we may scatter the earth's darkness with the light of Christ, 
that preaching the just word and practicing what we preach, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That by God's grace, we may have the courage to see our blind spots and so see ourselves, others, and the world more clearly, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That God, who so loved the world that he gave his only Son, may banish deeds of darkness from our society by the light of truth, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That this community may be a light to those wanting sight and acceptance, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have gone before us, now enjoying full peace with God, might be a source of strength to those left behind, we especially remember Charles Stottman. For these we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we ask you to receive these prayers that we make in faith through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever and Blessed be Lord God of all creation, through your goodness you have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness you have this wine to offer fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice that we offer you with humbled and contrite hearts. Lord God, wash away our iniquities and cleanse us all from all our sins. And pray, church, that this our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, our Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the good of all God's church. Lord, by the grace of this sacrifice, may we who ask forgiveness be ready to forgive one another. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us lift up our hearts. We lift them up. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Father, powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. You ask us to express our thanks by self denial. We are to master our sinfulness and conquer our pride. We are to show those in need your goodness to ourselves. Now, with the saints and the angels, we praise you forever as we sing. God of power, God of light, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Sana in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Sana in the highest. O Sana in the Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death that he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his friends and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be poured out for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Please do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. 
Christ in you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread and this serving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with Francis, the Bishop of Rome, and all the bishops and clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone from this light. In baptism, they died with Christ. May they also share his resurrection. Remember all our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on all of us, make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Joseph, her husband, the apostles, and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you, in union with them, and give you glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. And together we say, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. And together we pray as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us from everything that is evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all worry as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you say to your apostles, I leave you peace. My peace I give to you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom where you live forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with you. And Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by will of the Father and work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy blood and blood, free us from all our sins and from every evil. Keep us faithful to your teaching and never let us depart from you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How blessed are we who are called to his supper. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to life everlasting. Let us pray. Gracious God, you united all who come into the world. Fill our hearts with the light of your gospel, that our thoughts may please you, and our love be sincere. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mass is ended. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.